Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ 304 to 307. Therapy quote number 304. The pre-Oedipal mother is unconsciously considered to be, quote, cruel, malicious, refusing, devouring. The children eating which of Grimm's fairy tale Hansel and Gretel seems to be her prototype. The reason for that fantastic misconception of the child is based on the projection of the child's own aggression onto the mother. So in an earlier video there was sort of this question about how the child or how does one represent the child's memories of when the mother is unavailable. So remember, uh, from birth to three months, the child creates two images of his mother, one being loving and satisfying, which in fairy tales can be seen as the fairy godmother. And when the mother is not available, the child creates an image of the, of the mother uh, or representation of the mother as being refusing. Um, so in, in fairy tales, this is seen as the witch. And there was a question in a previous video about this frightening witch, is it just the child's perception? Because of the size difference, he's this little helpless baby and the mother from his perspective is like a giant, you know? So is it just out of that? Or is it the child's, or does the child's anger towards the rejecting side of the mother, does that get infused with the image? And does the image sort of adapt because of the aggression and is that how and is that why the image in the fairy tale is so frightening so that was sort of an open-ended question here burglar says yes the reason the image of the rejecting side of the mother is so frightening is because it includes the child's aggression it's blended in because the child and the mother are still blurred they're fused together so he, he's saying, yes, it, it, it's, it's this way. So remember, fairy tales and myths are true on the inside, not on the outside. We, we create these stories on the outside as metaphors to symbolically represent, to symbolically represent the unconscious world, the inner world of uh, the different characters within. So all of the memories that the baby has of the mother being loving, that can be shown in the fairy tale as the as the fairy godmother and the refusing memories as the witch and uh, the unconscious ego as the protagonist and then you have characters and we that that are personifications of processes in the psyche right by the age of 3 the image of the mother comes together to form a whole object representation and the mother is seen as a realistic human being and everything's fine. But in, in an insecure attachment style, in the psychic world, from this, um, the baby's unconscious representation of himself, sees the mother as either a goddess or a witch, right? And then, un and if they're, and if by the age of three he doesn't, the splitting is still there, he doesn't achieve Ubuntu, whole object relations, this perception within can influence the way he sees the world later on. This can be seen in extreme opinions, somebody being all great and somebody being all bad, that, that reflects the splitting. Right. Um, you know, long ago, this, this uh, petrification of the splitting was called uh, an illness of the unconscious. That's how strongly they... Because I think long ago, they regarded this, they tried to look at this from a more psych, scientific point of view, like a, from a medical point of view. That idea got dropped. Now we're just saying unhappiness is a malady of the personal synthesis. It's a malady of the personal synthesis. Um, splitting precludes mourning, right? And if there's no mourning, then we're into complicated grief, aggravated grief, uh, grief gone awry, pathological nostalgia. That leads to stress, building upon stress. And one person said it led to him it led him to becoming a curmudgeon in old age or something because he wasn't able to bring the splits together. You need, you need mourning. 
So you need the mourning to find yourself. And you can mourn, the splits come together when there's a secure, when there's that inner ontological security, which is achieved from a safe attachment style from birth to six months. Remember, in the extended womb, the extended womb is from birth to six months. Humans come out of the womb too early, so an extended womb is created from birth to six months, called a stage of symbiosis, undifferentiation. The child doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins. And then at the age of six months, assuming that's uh, very safe, uh, then he can hatch slowly from six months to 36 months to reach the psychological birth. Remember what we said before? If that six months was gone foul, if the mother was too rejecting or unavailable, the psychic representation of the mother uh, is frightening in the fairy tale. All right. So that's, uh, yeah, that's interesting about why the rejecting memories of the mother are portrayed in myths and fairy tales as such a frightening, devouring witch, you know. Uh, that, so Burglar, I think, sides with the theory that the image morphs based on the child's aggression or anger towards the memories of the mother when the mother's not available, right? Not just the per perceptional thing of the baby being tiny and the mother being a giant, right? Okay, uh, 305. What we learn about the child and the adult through psychoanalysis shows that all the sufferings of later life are, for the most part, repetitions of these earlier ones. So this is this adds to our previous quotes regarding repetition compulsion going awry. When there's an insecure attachment style, that's a developmental trauma. When there's a trauma, the repetition compulsion. If it doesn't get healed by five at the latest, it's still going on. All of these immature infantile defense mechanisms are still being used. Projective, projective identification, externalization, displacement, uh, reaction formation, undoing magical thinking, all, all of these infantile childish mechanisms still active in a person's life. That's the repetition compulsion going awry. You see, he's caught in trying to heal from that old trauma of not getting Ubuntu, the whole object relations. So she says it like this, that uh, the unhappiness, the unlived life and adult life is a reflection of the trauma from childhood. It's a reflection of the insecure attachment style. So, and Burglar had the metaphor of, uh, let's, let's call the, the deep memory of the insecure attachment style the superego. So the superego is very strong. The inner critic in a person is very strong. If as an adult they want to be happy, the superego, the inner critic says, no, remember, you have an insecure attachment style. You haven't healed it. First you got to heal it. You got to mourn it. And then you can be happy. Don't, spirit, don't try to do a spiritual bypass. You're not, that's magical thinking. And yes, New Age movements may appeal to, to your childish magical thinking to make money, or, or, or maybe they're misguided, or wishful thinking or something. But no, no, uh, the superego says uh, you, you need to uh, uh, face the unconscious history, your unconscious memories. Uh, you have to forgive the parents. That brings up memories. That can lead to reparation of the self. Then the splits come together. Then you find your real self, right? If you, if you avoid all of that, that that's called moral agent, uh, moral responsibility, moral revolution, moral agency, for a person to take responsibility for his unconscious history, right? So Klein is saying, yeah, this unhappiness in adulthood, it's a repetition of the childhood trauma. So she says it very simply there. Again. What we learn about the child and the adult through psychoanalysis shows that all the sufferings of later life are for the most part repetitions of earlier ones. See, that's the Sisyphus. That's the Sisyphus. Repetition compulsion gone awry. You know? Burglar's version of this is that the baby wants a secure attachment. Step one, it got ref refused. Step two, the baby wanted to protest. Step three, he couldn't because of his helplessness. And step four, the unlived life. That's the trauma. And then in adulthood, you're trying to repeat that. But this time, you're going to you're going to protest because the adult now has motor skills and he can speak.
but he's just repeating that childhood, those four steps from childhood. That's Bergler's version of the repetition compulsion, going awry. He calls it psychic masochism. That's his phrase for those four steps. And then Klein here is saying, whatever you call it, the repetition compulsion going awry, uh, she's calling it, that's, that reflects the trauma of the childhood. 306. Man's understanding of man has not kept pace with scientific development. A lot of authors have said something to this effect. Einstein is famous for saying something to this effect. And um, object relations theory is uh, catching up, I think. Uh, I think what Masterson, what Burglar, Karen Horney, and Masterson, along with others, have done is to help uh, develop our un the understanding of ourselves. Three oh seven. Humans have faced outer frontiers. If dreams of liberty, equality, and fraternity are to be realized, we must face inner frontiers too. We must clear the forests of intolerance, understand the dams of grief, and write the constitution of affection. So that's just one way. That's just one way of what Wilson was saying in an earlier video about the moral revolution, to know thyself. But the self has two parts, the conscious and the unconscious. We live in two worlds, the conscious and the unconscious, the outer and the inner. To know thyself is to know both worlds. And that's the moral revolution, to know thyself, both parts. He's just saying it in a, in a more uh, poetic way or something. Uh, we have two uh, inner frontiers. The final frontier, maybe it's the inner frontier, right? Um, the inner world, clear the force of intolerance. So that, that again is the in, reference to the in, infantile, immature defense mechanisms still being used as an expression of the insecure attachment style, the developmental arrest, and the repetition compulsion going awry. That leads to difficulties in seeing. Remember, neurotics don't see reality. They, they see their fantasies, and they react to their fantasies based on their childhood, unconsciously. And so there's a lot of, lot of confusion there. The dams of grief. Splitting precludes mourning. And if we don't mourn, then you're getting into complicated grief. That's like a dam of grief, you know, the dams of grief. Um, and a good example of this was uh, the clip we showed before from uh, Kirikou and the Sorceress, the animated film, the French film, where the lady got in touch with her grief and she released the dam. And uh, that, that means uh, she, released, she reached the awareness of the imperfection of her parents and the feelings for her related to that. And she was able to do that. And the splits come together and she felt safe enough, she could do it, she could cry, she could uh, mourn, and that she, so she released the dams of grief. So she didn't become a curmudgeon at the end, but you can see in that movie, she was a curmudgeon, you see? But then when she did the grief work, she became a human being afterwards, like a, a loving, caring, uh, her natural self, right? And write the constitution of effect. So that just means the moral revolution Kristen, uh, Kristen Wilson is calling for the moral revolution to look within to know thyself. That's the that's the constitution of affection to to uh, to look within to heal the man in the mirror. Right. Okay, so I'll just do a quick zip through here. The pre oedipal mother is unconsciously considered to be quote cruel, malicious, refusing, devouring. The children eating which of Grimm's fairy tale Hansel and Gretel seems to be her prototype. The reason for that fantastic misconception of the child is based on the projection of the child's own aggression onto the mother. What we learn about the child and the adult and the adult through psychoanalysis shows that all the sufferings of later life are for the most part repetitions of these earlier ones. Man's understanding of man has not kept pace with scientific development. 
Humans have faced outer frontiers. If dreams of liberty, equality, and fraternity are to be realized, we must face inner frontiers too. We must clear the forests of intolerance, understand the dams of grief, and write the constitution of affection. Just one, one way of talking about the personal agency, uh, the moral uh, revolution where a person uses their moral agency to heal their unconscious history, their childhood past. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, if a person has an insecure attachment style, they're going to be caught in a repetition compulsion, going awry. What uh, Klein was saying in 305 here, the repetition, the Sisyphus thing, right? Yeah. So, and again, like the child said, Fairy tales and myths are true on the inside, not on the outside. Nobody's saying the mother is devouring, is going to eat the children. <laughs> but in the psychic representation of the other, overcomes the psychic representation of the self. And it's like this psychic other image devours the psychic image of the self. And what does the image of the self do? It identifies with the aggressor to cope with it. it how does he survive? He, he becomes the mother. So you can see people with a narcissistic pattern. They, they think, talk, and act like their mother. They're very aggressive. And, uh, and um, they, they relate to others. They don't have whole object relations, right? You don't see people with a narcissistic pattern expressing a wide range of uh, affection and, and, and uh, tenderness or feeling or Gratitude. I don't think I've. If if a person with a narcissistic uh, pattern says expresses gratitude, it's probably some kind of strategy toward to meet his narcissistic need or something. So it's not like a heartfelt um, gratitude. Anyways, nar the the topic of the narcissistic pattern has been briefly mentioned already, but more will follow in the future. That, that's another tough thread: the narcissistic pattern. Basically, the child has identified with the mother All right. yeah yeah I see Edmund Burglar plays a major uh, plays a major uh, role in, in this series a number of his, a number of his quotes have come up and uh, he talks he talked about so many things you know about the psychology of fill in the blank you name it he's probably covered it you know <laughs> And Klein is one of the mothers of psychoanalysis. Klein, Melanie Klein, Karen Horney, and Margaret Mahler are the three mothers of psychoanalysis. Um, uh, maybe others will disagree with that, but to my mind, those are the three. Right? And uh, yeah, uh, so again, we're trying to. Like the last video said, we're trying to welcome the feeling self back in. Once we get the feeling self back in, we're good. That's it. We, once we, we feel content, we feel inner pleasure. We, we have that inner comfort from the feeling self. Wilson said, right, uh, once we feel, we're good. Like, yeah, that was, that was part of her speech. Uh, Kristen Wilson, if you haven't heard, it, has this speech called, Ooh, My Soul. And at the end of it, she came to that conclusion. Once we get the feeling self back into our bodies, and it's animated in, in us, it's, the feeling self is there, okay, we've, we're good. <laughs> we can calm down. We found equanimity, inner calm, inner comfort. Uh, we're not, we have that ontological security. We, we've, we've achieved ontological security, which most, which many children get by the age of three with the secure attachment style, um, but many don't and have to get through the through the pro, through the process of healing. Okay, I, I guess I'll just leave it here. So thank you very much. This has been TQ 304, 305, 306, and 307. More to follow. More quotes from Edmund Berger in future videos. Uh, more from Melanie Klein, one of the mothers of psychoanalysis and more about the moral revolution to heal ourselves. 
Bye for now. Thank you.